Welcome back. Now let's look at, at the full SLP method, uh, phases and structure of it. We've, we, we had a little learn by doing exercise uh, where we, we diagrammed and we charted and we learned about letters and colors and so forth. Um, in this session, we're gonna stand back and look at the full SLP method and how to apply it on a project. So this is the SLP method on a page. We call this the capsule summary of the method. And there's three, three parts to it. In the upper left corner, you have what we call the framework of phases, four phases of layout planning. Location, overall layout, that, that means block. Detailed layout, that means actual equipment layouts. Um, and then installation. Now, the first and the, the fourth phase there aren't really layout planning per se. Uh, the, the actual development of plans happens in the two interior phases. Phase two, where we do a block. Phase three, where we do equipment inside each block. In those phases, which are, are truly layout planning, we're gonna proceed on the basis of the three fundamentals that we've seen in the previous sessions, relationship, space, adjustment in that order. And what's happening here on the capsule summary is we're scaling those three fundamentals up into a, a set, really, of, of work procedures. We call it the pattern of procedures. There are five sections. You'll see some, some numbers over here, one through five. And each of those sections uh, takes a portion of the layout planning process, breaks it out, into specific tasks with specific deliverables. We're gonna, we're gonna learn all those in, in the subsequent sessions. Right now, I'm just giving you the overall structure and how, how it will actually be applied. Across the bottom of this are things that you've actually seen and used in the learn by doing um, exercise. We, we, we use the symbols, we use the colors, we use the numbers of lines on the vowel letter scale and so forth. There may be a, a, a few things there that you haven't seen yet. We'll, we will come to those in time, but that part of the methodology should be familiar to you by now if you've been through the, the previous sessions here. Let's, uh, let's start with the phases. Let's talk about the four phases for a minute. The notion here is that every layout project, project should start with a phase about the location. Where is the layout to be planned? Where, where's the area to be planned? How much space is available in that area? What are the surrounding influences that may cause us to, to uh, uh, place things in a certain way? So uh, that's phase one. It's a bit of a real estate decision. Now, it, it, it could range from finding a piece of property to simply deciding where in an existing layout we're going to, to place a new activity, but that's phase one. Phase two is, we, we call it overall layout, but if, from the picture there, you can see what we really mean are blocks of space. This is gonna show us the placement of the main areas. The exercise that we just did, that was a good example of blocks, not equipment. Uh, usually you know where the main aisles are gonna go at the end of this phase. Uh, you will know some equipment, and we'll come back to that discussion in a minute, but the, but the true generation of equipment layout, detailed layout we call it, happens in phase three, and it's happening inside each block that we placed in phase two. That's uh, uh, an important aspect of the, of the SLP method. Uh, installation is the actual doing. That's taking the approved plan and making it happen, put, putting, it, putting it into place. Now, these are drawn uh, sort of equal in length just to get them on the page and talk about them, but they're never equal in duration in actual practice. So I'll give you a couple of for instances. Let's say that uh, you have a project, you're crowded in an order fulfillment area, and you want to rearrange it. And uh, it's next to the storage area, the finished goods storage. Uh, and you rearrange it, and you bring it back and show it to the 
to the site manager and he says, well, I, I, I thought we were crowded in there. It looks like you're still crowded. And you say, well, well, we are still crowded. We did the best we could, but it's, it's really not enough space. And he says, well, did you think about going across the aisle and taking down some pallet racks, get yourself some more space? And your answer might be no, we didn't think about that. <clears throat> In which case you, 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 you've got a bit of a failure there if that's a possibility. So what, what we're suggesting here is that phase one of a project like that would be to sit with the appropriate manager and say, look, it's, we're crowded down in there. Uh, in this project, are we permitted to take some space from the warehouse and see what we can do with that? Would you entertain that kind of, a, of an enlargement of the area? And the answer might be no, which case you're done. That was a quick, quick phase one. The answer might be maybe, you know, why don't you do a layout or two that does that, show it to us, and then we'll decide. So you get a kind of a conditional answer. But the thing we're trying to avoid with this structure is if you don't ask and you get all the way to the end and that question comes up, you got rework and, and, and you're, wasting, you're wasting time and, and so forth. At the other extreme, it might be that we want to have a, a, a new factory in uh, Texas and we can't decide should it be in Houston or Dallas or or uh, San Antonio, you know. So we got we got three communities that we need to to one of which will be cho chosen, and then we need to pick a property within those communities. So we're a long way from from having a location before we can actually begin to plan the building. And those are the extremes. One might be a ten minute discussion. The the other might be a ten month real estate project. It's very different. Uh, the other thing that, that I'll say about these phases and the way that they're drawn up here is that the overlaps are deliberate, that um, we're trying to make the point that you should be in to the next phase in layout planning before you close the current phase that you're in. By that, for example, let's say you're in the location phase and you're looking at, at some uh, leased buildings or something that you're going to rent for a few years and set something up in there. And what you'd like is for for people that are knowledgeable enough about the the overall layout to have a seat at that table and say, well, wait a minute, this building is 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 better than that building because of the column spacing or the overall dimensions of it or or whatever the reason. You'd like not to have somebody lease the building. And then give it to the ops people and say, okay, make this work. Um, <clears throat> the same is true actually in phase two or similar that you would like to be down in the details of critical equipment before you uh, finalize the block layout. Because you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta respect the dimensional requirements and the shapes and so forth of the details. So most project management teaches you that phases have a gate at the end. You come to the end, you make a decision, you open the gate, and you enter the next phase. And in layout work, you don't want to work like that. You, you want to be in the next phase before you close up the, the one that you're in. That way you'll have less rework. You'll be, you'll be better informed about the, the needs at the next level down, so to speak. Uh, just a couple of pictures in here. You know, phase one could be an open field and we can do just about anything we want. Uh, there's no issues. Uh, at the other extreme, I could be rearranging a hundred year old factory that has 57 different buildings, uh, different roof heights, different floor levels, all kinds of complications. So there's a huge difference between this and this. The, uh, the other slide that I have in here is if you if you take the if you take the roof off a building or you, you look at the property and you look at the surroundings and the, the facility and its conditions, you have um, things that will influence the layout where you can put things on a second floor, uh, where you could put a potential new dock or not. Um, those kinds of things need to be understood. We call it part of that phase one kind of kind of getting conditioned to the to the uh, to the location. If I take the roof off that building, 
and I look inside, I have another, another kind of thing that comes up, and we call it fixity. That's not a real word, but, but you, you, I think you understand what I mean here is that so, some things are never going to move. If, if you look in this, in this layout right here, this uh, production line that's in here is sitting on a huge concrete foundation. It's not moving. We're, we're not, that will never be rearranged. That will be there when the building is abandoned. And, and someone will have to dig that out if they ever want to use the, the land for another purpose. Um, that, that's what you might call a monument. You know, it can't, it can't be moved. Um, the yellow areas here in this picture, these, these are things that maybe could be moved if we had a strong enough uh, business case, be very expensive, maybe, maybe even disruptive production-wise, but we'd entertain it if you had a strong enough uh, proposal or reason for doing it. The other thing that's typically happening in rearrangement projects, which is what this, this picture is all about, in, in most larger facilities, even the smaller ones I suppose, but, but more common in a larger facility, there are projects that you've already gotten approved that are going to happen and decisions have already been made about where things will go or which things are going to leave. And so in, in this illustration here, those are coded in green. Those are things that will be moved, installed, or, or rearranged. That's important to know, again, at the beginning of your project, because that may create the white space that you need to, to start on a, re, on a rearrangement. So three illustrations of things that, that come up in phase one. Um, there is the larger question of, of finding a site in the first place, and we will have a, uh, that's a, topic later on in this series. Now, let's, let's go back to the actual planning again, and let's remind ourselves that that planning procedure is going to rest on the three fundamentals, which are relationships, space, and adjustment. Now, I think that made sense to us when we saw it and made sense to us when we, we worked through that in our, in our uh, learn by doing exercise. So, Let's scale that up in, into a pattern of planning procedures. And uh, this pattern is resting on those three fundamentals, relationship, space, and adjustment, starting with relationships. Uh, on the, the left side, we're going to have inputs. And on the right side, we're going to have outputs, the first of which is, is the list of activity areas. So. The first thing we want is to divide up the total operation to be planned into a list of areas uh, representing all of the things that need to be involved in the layout. Um, and then as you proceed down through the, the procedures, analytics are on the left, synthesis or outputs are on the right. So uh, let me back that up just a minute. We'll take that first a list of activity areas and we'll say, okay, the first analysis that we want to do is to understand the flow of materials and any other relationships that would be um, operational in, the, in this planning. That is going to be documented on a relationship chart from which we're going to make a diagram. And you've seen an example of how that works. Now that's all we can do with relationships. So then the second fundamental of space comes into play. And now we want to know how much space is required for each activity area. And does the total space needed fit inside the location available? The, the, the location available having been determined in the prior phase one. Once that fits, we'll have a session on that. Uh, then we can draw the space relationship diagram, and you've seen an example of how that works. That is the theoretical best arrangement of activities in space without regard yet for the actual location. So it's going to get adjusted in section four. Typically, there are a number of modifications and limitations that come into play at that point. Could be features in the existing building, if that's what you're working with. Could be uh, code requirements, insurance regulations. Um, uh, could be any number of things. Material handling methods that, that, would, that would cause us to deviate somewhat or to adjust 
from the, uh, the theoretical arrangement in the space relationship diagram. So going through that, those modifications and limitations, that journey results in alternative layouts. And the, and the premise here is two or more. It could be three, it could be five, it could even be nine. It could be a big number. Um, but the point is always two or more. And then there's a formal evaluation uh, of those options, uh, typically by a, a group of people that would be sitting in judgment of what's, what's been proposed. And then out of that comes a consensus on what is the best plan. That becomes the selected plan or the approved plan for the phase that we're in, which, which will first be overall layout and then later will be detailed or equipment layouts inside each block. Uh, I just want to dwell for a moment on the notion of the, of the two or more alternatives. I want, to, I want to say just from experience, you will be more productive and you will get a better layout faster, much faster, if you follow these procedures. If you get all the relationships first, document and visualize them in a diagram. Get all of your space requirements, validate that it fits, quantify any shortage and resolve that, then add that to your, your diagrammatic view. Then, with that as your starting point, create, develop two, three, four, however many alternatives it, it takes to explore the good ideas that you have. And then don't, don't pick one or fall in love with one and try to sell it. Bring the set to the, to the evaluation and get approval of the best plan. That, that will save you time and get you a better result in our experience. Now, I skipped over, uh, if you go back and you look at the, at the top of this thing, there's some letters up here, PQRST, and I, I didn't speak to that. Some of you were wondering, what is that? Is he ever gonna explain it? Yeah, I'm going to now. That's shorthand. Uh, it's, it's a teaching memory jogger, fingers of one hand, letters that you learned when you were a child, uh, when you learned your alphabet, PQRST. Each letter stands for a set or a type of information that you need before you start doing the layout planning. So the, the premise here is that we're gonna get this information as inputs to the planning process. We're not gonna get down into the planning and then discover, oh, we don't know X, or we still don't know Y, or we, we should have, you know. So, so we're gonna start with P, which stands for products or materials. What's being produced? Or if you were uh, maybe doing a, a distribution center or something, what, what's being distributed from this, this place or this layout? And we're talking now about physical requirements, physical characteristics of the products or materials, sizes, weights, shapes, and so forth. Um, that's not the same as Q. Q is how much, how much is being produced. At what rate are we, are we producing products or, or material from this operation that's being laid out, this process that we're laying out. Um, there's another form of Q that's, that's necessary. So quantity of output typically is expressed as a rate, so many units per day, so many pieces per hour, however you want to express that. There's another form of, of Q or quantity data that relates to how much material is present when it's at rest, when it's being staged for next operation or for, first, for, for consumption, if it's raw material. So we need to know how much is on hand. That's an inventory question. Um, I need to know both. I need to know production rates, how much is flowing, and inventory levels or staged quantities, how much is sitting there when it's not flowing. R stands for routing. It's really the process. It's the sequence of operations performed on the products or materials. But we're trying to do an ease of recall thing and we already used P for products. So you can't say, you can't use P again and have that work. So we used R, routing, or uh, routing if you're from Australia. Uh, what, what this is, typically it would be expressed as a, as a diagram of some kind or a list of operations. It would also include the machinery or the equipment that would be uh, involved in, in executing or performing the process. 
So there's quite a bit of information involved uh, behind that letter there. S has several meanings. Uh, S stands for supporting services. So um, when you think about the transformation of material or products uh, into, into a finished good of some kind um, or output of an operation, you're not typically thinking about the fact that there has to be an air compressor over there in the corner or a nitrogen tank outside the building or um, a, an electrical room providing the necessary power or a battery charging station for your, your forklift or a maintenance crib uh, somewhere. So those things typically get lost or overlooked, uh, but may be relevant, may, may need to be considered in the layout, either, either for reasons of space or for relationships. Um, so this is, a, this is a list. Basically, we're saying we need a list of what those supporting services are. Uh, I just gave you examples of, of process support. There's other kinds of support for people. So there are break rooms, restrooms, uh, team meeting areas, um, uh, on and on, offices. And, and so uh, those, are, those are necessary to be listed and understood as well. Again, because they may take space and they may have relationships that matter to the plan. Uh, T stands for time or time-related information. Uh, this has several meanings. The one that comes to mind first, let's re relate it back to the processes. Uh, let's say you've got five or six processes, but they're not all running at the same time. Let's say you're welding on two shifts, but you're only painting on one, or vice versa. You're painting on two shifts, but you're only welding on one shift. Well, when, when those are not running concurrently, you're going to have a, you're going to need a buffer of some kind in there. So we need to understand those operating times. Uh, we need to understand the days of operation, the number of shifts, the hours of those shifts. Those are real basic aspects of time. Um, we may also need to understand seasonality, that things may be, uh, quantities may be higher at a certain time of year than than uh, at others. So um, this is time-related information uh, that will show up as, as important in the layout process. Um, a key feature of SLP, systematic layout planning, is that each section in the pattern, and there are five, each section has a key document. So I've got the five sections, and on this table then, I'm, I'm, I'm recording here or presenting, what is the key document, the thing that you must do in that section of the pattern? And then there are a number of other potentially useful things that you could do. This series, in subsequent sessions, we're going to show you each of these key documents and, and most of the others that are listed here that would be useful or helpful for you. And then there's a specific form of output. So I've already said, you know, the, the output of the first section is a list of activity areas. The output of the second section is an activity relationship diagram, and you know what that is. The output of the third. So, so this is just a tabular summary of what I've been saying, but I want you to appreciate that, that there are uh, predefined a, a large number of potentially useful documents uh, for managing all this information, gathering it, and, and, and applying it. Um, and that's a good thing because what that gives you is a very um, well-documented process at the end, something that you can storyboard and present to your, to your approvers. If I think about phase two, and I'm just picking a, an example here, and I go through the, the outputs and the key documents here, I start with a list of areas in the upper left corner of this picture. Then I've got a flow diagram. That's my flow analysis. I've got a relationship chart that's capturing the flow and the other relationships. I'm combining those and visualizing them in a relationship diagram. I'm collecting the space, how much, what kind, any mandatory shape or configuration. I'm, 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 I'm getting that in a table which I'm then mapping to my diagram 
to, 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 to create a space relationship diagram uh, from which I'm going to adjust into two or three or more alternative layouts, which we're then going to evaluate in a formal way and get a score and agree on which is the best, the best layout for this face. Now, there's, there's a number of mechanical questions about how you do these things, who should be involved in each step. I don't, I don't want to get ahead of the game here and going down into that depth. We're going to come back and talk about each step in much greater depth, but I want you to see the big picture here. This is, a, this is standard work for layout. It, it is a, a set of templates that you populate for your project. And I, 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 obviously, I, I, I trust the method. I, I live by the method. I'm a product of the method, but, but it's, it's darn near bulletproof. This works every time. Uh, it's very hard to go wrong when you follow these steps and you produce these documents and you involve the appropriate people, you're gonna end up with a good result. And, and the process that you follow is gonna command a lot of respect if you walk people through this and let them know that that's, that's how you got to the plan that you're now presenting to them uh, for, for approval. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about the difference between phase two and phase three. So in phase two, we're doing an overall or block layout. In phase three, we need to lay out the equipment within each block. So what I'm, what I'm trying to demonstrate here on this, on this plan is that this, this department, the cutting and scoring department, this is a print shop now, or printing plant, uh, they cut and score cardstock. This is for, like for greeting cards. Think of it as that. Um, and so in detail, this plan here is the arrangement of the cutting and scoring department. That, those are individual machines and benches and operator stations and so forth for that purpose. Uh, in SLP, we get to the detail using the same process, the same procedures. So in overall layout, we follow the procedures or we apply them once to get the overall layout. In phase three, we apply them to each block as needed to get the detailed equipment layouts within each block. Some blocks don't need this. You know, if, if one of the blocks is uh, finished good storage and it's just pallet rack, we don't need to go through a SLP process to lay that out. There may be some minor questions about aisle, aisle spacing or rack orientation, but it doesn't rise to the level of, of an SLP. On the other hand, we may have, we may have some departments like the one that we're about to, to illustrate, cutting and scoring, where there's quite a bit of, of internal operational uh, uh, relationships and so forth that need to be respected. So when you have that, you have in SLP, again, a set of um, key documents, things that you must do. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of difference in those between phase two and phase three. There's another list, a longer list of potentially useful documents. Uh, some are the same as phase two, but others are unique to phase three. And then there's your, your form of output. I, I said this in the introduction, but the working forms that, that you will see in SLP are available to you on a website. You, you will be asked to register, but once you've registered, and I would say bookmark that page so you don't, you don't have to register each time, all of the forms that you're gonna see that, that are needed to apply SLP and that I just listed in these tables, those are all there for you to take in Excel. There may be, there may be one or two minor exceptions, uh, but generally they're, they're gonna be there. Um, and so there's a prescribed form of output. Again, this is standard work for, for detail. And because it is, I can storyboard the detail in the same way that I storyboarded the entire layout project. Now, at first glance, you say, well, that's, that's the same slide you showed me a minute ago. No, it's not. In this case, the list is the, is, is the equipment and uh, the workstations that exist only within the cutting and scoring department. The material flow analysis is the movement of material between 
the, the machinery and stations inside this area. The other relationships are within this area. The diagram is of the area, of the equipment and the stations. Space at this level is very specific. Um, in the old days, uh, you got this in one way or another. Today, we have marvelous ways of getting three-dimensional understanding of, of the objects that we're laying out. We may even have in, in the computer system a three-dimensional representation of each object that we can move around in, in virtual uh, space. But however you do it, you need to know a lot of detail about the dimensions of the objects. This needs to be pretty specific. It's not, it's not some block that can be stretched or adjusted into, into a layout. At least when equipment's involved, it's not. But we can summarize. We can still summarize uh, in a table our total requirements and talk about whether the area that's been allocated is sufficient or not. Uh, the, the space relationship diagram, I'm showing it to you in two dimensions. Uh, that is, could be, I, I suppose, a three-dimensional representation, but, but it's still valid uh, as, a, as a visualization of what we would like to have, an ideal arrangement of the objects at scale. It's one step away from the actual detailed equipment layout. And here again, there'll always be two or more of these um, different ways that you can arrange the equipment and the stations and, and so forth, the racks and all of, all of that. And so that means we need to do that. And then we need to involve the appropriate people. Typically, it's going to involve the operators or the lead operator, certainly the supervisor, the lead operator, maybe the engineer responsible for this space, uh, maybe some others. but but. Those, th those people will evaluate those alternatives and decide which plan is best. That's, that's SLP. Uh, and again, marvelous tool for documentation. And in today's world, you don't, you don't typically get to specialize and just be a layout planner. That's a hat you wear every now and then. And so the beauty of this is I think it's going to make you a professional layout planner, a professional grade, even though you do this rarely and intermittently, it's a crutch. It's, it's, it's telling you what to do next. It's telling you whether you're done. And it's giving you the documentation to help you sell the result when, when you get to that, that point in, in the process. Um, OK, so we're, we're back here to the capsule summary. And, and what you've seen with those kind of cartoons is that, that each, each of these boxes here has a, a, typically a document or a form of output, and that's how you know you're done. Um, let's say you got a small, a really small project. Uh, it's 5,000 square feet, 500 square meters of, of maintenance bay. It's the maintenance department. We, we want to move it. We want to get it out of the way of, of something else. We're going to use that space for, for a big new machine, and maintenance has got to find a new home. And I've inherited the project to lay out the new maintenance shop. Um, do I need four phases? Do, do I need a five-section pattern of procedures and all of that and a flow analysis? No, you don't. That's so straightforward that you ought to be able to do it in, in six easy steps. And so there is a short form of SLP, which is pictured here in the middle of the, of the uh, capsule summary. And that short form reduces the entire process, the entire SLP uh, pattern kind of to, to, to six steps. Um, those six steps are explained here on this page, or named and explained. We start with a chart of relationships. We don't do a flow analysis for, for two reasons. First of all, there might not be any flow, because this is often used for support areas. Second, if you think about this for a minute, as areas get smaller, measuring the flow becomes a, a kind of a, a silly exercise. Uh, you, it, it's a science project. It doesn't really matter to the result because all the routes are short, relatively speaking. There isn't enough difference at that, at that 
size of area to matter one versus the other. So when areas get small, we would say generally, um, certainly less than 5,000 square feet, but I, I would say you could probably stretch that to, to 15, 20, even 25,000 square feet. Um, our experience is that most of the routes are so short that the if one layout makes makes some shorter than others, it doesn't translate into any meaningful um, differences. So we dispense with the flow analysis and we go straight to a chart. You can still have flow of materials as a reason, but we're not going to take the time to measure it. In second uh, spot there, we get the space requirements, and you've seen that with the same table that we would use in the full method. How much, what kind, any mandatory shape or configuration. We're still going to make a diagram of activity relationships. Uh, but we're going to go straight from that diagram to, to blocks. This says um, space relationship layouts. And if you look at the picture, it's blocks. So we're not, we're not going to take the time to do a space relationship layout. We're going to go straight to the, to the drawing because the, the area that we're planning is, is small. The number of activities is limited. And so that's, that's a fine way to do it. Then we're still going to have a, a formal evaluation of the options. Notice we're still, we're still keeping this notion that you're going to have two or more options, which you're then going to evaluate in a formal way. And then the last step is to lay in the equipment. Uh, another point that I haven't made. If you're, not, if you're not trained in this and you haven't been exposed to this, and you, you get the assignment to make a layout, most people think that what they have to produce before they show anything is they have to produce this, this equipment layout here, right here. I, I need to bring in a drawing that shows where everything's going to be. They don't know about the notion of a block. That's not part of your project plan. You, you, people are expecting to see the detail, and that's what you're going to give them. Well, that takes a long time to do. Detailed equipment layout takes a long time. Uh, blocks go very quick. I think we, we tried to demonstrate that in our exercise, that, that it takes just a couple of minutes to generate block plan. Uh, if I'd given you 20, 30, 40 pieces of equipment that had to go in that block plan, you'd still be working on it. You wouldn't be in this session. So uh, what am I trying to say? You can protect your time or that of, of your engineers by saying to yourselves and to your approvers, look, here's, here's how we're going to execute this process. We're going to do a block step here. In this case, it's, it's step four in the simplified uh, short form. It's phase two in the, in the big SLP. But we're going to bring you blocks, and we're going to ask for a decision over here on which block is best before we invest too much time in these details. We'll do enough detail to make sure that we're not, it's not a pig and a poke. We're, we're not proposing something here that won't work. But we're not going to refine it. We're not going to lay all the details in there until you give us a decision on which block we're going to go with. That's going to protect your engineering resources. It's also going to actually, over time, uh, you'll, you'll get results faster by doing it that way. So this is simplified. I want to say one other thing about this. Um, a number of textbooks, I think Wikipedia, other places that you can go to, to learn about SLP, people who have published on SLP, and there are plenty of people who have that, that aren't from Richard Muther and Associates, uh, but they have confused over many years simplified SLP, which I'm showing you on the screen right now, has been confused with the entire process. The, the, the big, the full SLP has kind of been lost, actually. Uh, and so there, there, there's a sort of a misunderstanding at uh, that, that this is SLP right here on this page. This is not SLP. This is simplified short form SLP for small areas uh, without, a, without a measured flow analysis. And I hope when you get done with this series, you'll, you'll appreciate that difference uh, um, and not, not make that mis, misunderstanding or misconception. Okay, let's see what we know. So how many phases does SLP use to describe a layout planning project? Three, 
four or five? What's the right answer? Hope you said four. It's three fundamentals. It's five sections in the planning pattern, but it's four phases. What are they? Location, overall or block, detail or equipment layout, installation. Uh, in the location phase, we determine what? How much space is available? Monuments and external or surrounding conditions that may influence our layout, or both? Answer is both. Uh, for best results, the SLP phases should overlap. Hopefully I made that point strongly. You wanna be in the next phase before you close the door on the one that you're in. True. Uh, you don't want to do a block, and then when you get down in the weeds on the detail, you find out, well, shoot, that block wasn't practical, that this, isn't a, this area isn't wide enough, it isn't long enough, or whatever. It, that, that's, that's a fail. That's rework that shouldn't, shouldn't happen. Um, <laughs> it may not be possible to, to, to process this next issue, but you'd, you'd like not for your real estate people or your executives or your owners to be going out making real estate decisions and then giving you the building to make it work as a, as a productive layout. And not, not that it won't work, but you, you will get better site selection decisions if you let phase two, the overall layout, be, be running before you close the door on phase one location. Uh, SLP planning pattern. A has five sections. Beginning with inputs, ending with a layout. Yeah, it does. Rests on the three fundamentals? Right. Produces a key document and a defined output for each section. Yes. In other words, these are not just blocks with, with words in them telling you what you're going to do. There is an actual document that needs to be completed to signify that you've completed that step. Produces two or more alternative plans for formal evaluation, yep. But that's up to you now. I mean, SLP doesn't automatically do that. You gotta do it. But if you're following, if you're following the, the guidance of the pattern, you'll have a plan, we called it X, Y, and Z. Applies to both the overall and the phase three, yes it does. Same pattern, same steps. Key documents might differ a little bit because of the, the level of detail, but otherwise the same. So the right answer here is what? All of the above. Um, summary, it's, this is a complete method. Most people don't realize that. They, the SLP in the literature, the textbooks, the handbooks has kind of been extracted and abstracted. And, and so people don't understand anymore that it's a complete system of planning and executing layout projects. It's got the framework of phases, the pattern of procedures, and it's got the conventions. A lot of people confuse SLP with just the conventions or the simplified short form. Um, the, the, we've said this, the procedures you execute once for block, you repeat as much as you need for the detail. Uh, every step has the, has the key document and output. And the sixth step, don't confuse that with the full method, can be used for small projects or detail planning in departments and small areas of a larger plan. So it's a complete predefined system. You almost know what you're gonna do even before you accept the layout assignment. You got a mental picture of what it is you're gonna to need to do. Now, there's some, there's some supplemental reading here. Um, you should have gotten this, this, at least the soft copy of this book. You don't. You don't need the hard copy. Some of, some of you don't have a place for a hard copy anymore. So, so, but the soft copy's there. And to, to reinforce what I've just said and to see a little more depth, what you want to do is look at chapters one and two and the introduction to part three in the SLP text. And that, that will be a good follow-up to what we just discussed. We'll see you in the next session.